So we're going to continue in Romans 1. And um, so you can see the little picture. This is definitely relevant to today's culture. <laughs> that is, I think... He's got a deep belly. Yeah, he's. <laughs> I mean, she's pregnant. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that is a transgender dude. Yeah. Guy who thinks he's a girl. What is that? A transgender woman? Is that how you say that? They're transgender women. They're really <laughs> men. I don't know. It's all ridiculousness in my yeah. book. And this chapter in this segment we're going to look at today, if we get through uh, where I'm planning, talks about all of that. Um, so it's very, very, very relevant to even today's culture, which is amazing that he was talking about this 2,000 years ago. <laughs> and that stuff was going on back then, still going on today. It's just more out there today, it seems like, for whatever reason. Uh, but we kind of concluded with verse 15 last time we were here together. Uh, so I'm going to pick up with verse 14 and 15 and kind of recap a thought as we go into verse 16, which is a very, hey, good morning, happy Mother's Day. A uh, very well-known passage, uh, verse 16. But 14, he says, this is, again, Paul writing about the year, what did we say, 57, somewhere around there, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, 57, he wrote this letter from Corinth. Yeah, 57. And um, he says, I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Basically, he's saying to everyone. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. So that term debtor means that he feels he must pay this forward. Just what he's got through the gospel is so impactful in his life. He just has to tell people about it. So that's what that word debtor means. And he's saying, I'm ready uh, to come to Rome and to preach there. Again, he's not yet gotten to Rome. He does end up there in the last few years of his life. Uh, not the way he thought he was going, but <laughs> he does end up there. And he says, I must... Do what? It never happens. Yeah, it never happens the way we think. That's right, exactly. Um, so he says, I'm ready to come to Rome and preach the gospel, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This is a very popular verse and one we should probably know and memorize. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, or you could probably substitute the word Gentile in that case. Has anyone ever asked you the question, what is the gospel? Hmm. And if someone were to ask you, what is the gospel, what would you tell them? Because <laughs> people need to know what the gospel is. The good news of Do what? The good, news of the good news of Christ. Good God's Word. God's Word. The sharing of God's word. The sharing of God's word. You got any thoughts, Zachary? Mm. If you had to explain what the gospel is. Doesn't gospel mean good news? Gospel means good news. But in context of the Bible's gospel, what would you how would you explain that to somebody if they asked you? God's grace. Okay, God's grace. My answer would probably be Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection because that's the message of the gospel. He died for our sins, conquered death, so that we can also have eternal life. According to this verse, what the gospel is, and Paul's perspective in this moment he's writing is, it is the power of God unto salvation. So that's, that's a good biblical definition of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. Of course, then people ask, well, what's well, salvation? I <laughs> and salvation, how would we answer that? What do you think? Okay. It's what God gives us. When we've confessed our sins and put our faith but what is it? In Him, salvation is God's grace. Okay, God's, God's grace. grace. I would say it's the freedom from the penalty of sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
you know, we're going to physically die, but spiritually we're going to live forever. It is the removal, because we're going to continue to sin, but we're not going to have to go to hell. Because Jesus paid for our sin on the cross. Hell and year, but then we've got an eternity. Yeah, right. Without sin. Exactly. We have an eternity mm-hmm. without sin, so it's the freedom without from pain, sin. Without Absolutely. Doubts, without so salvation is basically is deliverance from sin and the penalty of sin mm-hmm. through Christ is the power of God and the salvation to whom? Everyone that believeth. It is not targeted to any specific group of people or any person. It is open to everyone that believes. To the, the Jew, Jew first. To the Jew first, which they rejected it. No, well, some of them, most of them did. The, 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 that's what's interesting. The Jewish leaders of the church rejected it. But some Jewish people received it, and that's where the church began to develop. But look who received it. And look who rejected it. Right. God had to get the leaders out of the way. There you go, yeah. Kind of removal of people's fear of the leadership to say, I'm just going to believe this regardless of what they do and say and think about it. Because it was such a good news, which is again what the word gospel means that's come into the world. It's just an amazing story that that everyone, it, they kind of bypass the leadership level of that. They just, Jesus came straight to the lowly of lowlies and the, and the shepherds of the field was the very first announcement from the angels of the birth of Christ. And, he came and he says, "If you want this, it's available." And there, in that day, there was not, there were not people very much lower right. than fishermen. That's exactly and right. Shepherds. Yeah, they were kind of the the outcasts, and nobody wanted to have nothing to do with them, kind of thing. And that's who Jesus went to first. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Angels and Jesus as well. You know, the first four disciples chosen were fishermen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> pretty cool Uh, for he goes on to say for therein in the gospel in salvation in the power of God in receiving this for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith so what do y'all think of that I've got a little commentary note on it but what do y'all think that means it is revealed from faith to faith For it is written, the just shall live. That phrase, the just shall live by faith, is actually a quote of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. So that even goes back to the Old Testament of living by faith in a future uh, sense. Even the Old Testament, people lived by faith, but they also followed a law ritual system as well. But they were following it because they believed in what God was saying, that a Messiah was one day coming. So it was still done in faith. Um, But it says that this is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. It's kind of a weird phraseology and mysterious in a way. Mine's a little different. What's your say? For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written. The righteous will live by faith. Okay, that's worded a little differently, and kind of gets a little more to the the context, I believe. Um, my study notes. We got anything? Oh no, I was just going to say you must have the amplified. I do. Yeah. No, yeah. no, it's not the amplified. It's the NIV. Is it? Oh, oh okay, okay, cool. I have the amplified. Right. So basically, what my study notes say about that is it your faith in Christ starts and ends with faith in Christ. It is from faith in the beginning to faith in the end. He is the author and finisher of our faith. It is all about faith having been placed in Jesus from start to finish. Is basically what my study notes kind of says about that. Um, So that's the good news. That's the gospel. Is We receive it by faith. We receive the righteousness of God. That's amazing to think about. That we as sinners and miserable, wretched, you know, lowly people who have done so many things against God, 
through the law can receive the righteousness of God. I think he talks about that in 2 Corinthians. He says that um, he who knew no sin became sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. So it's through Jesus we actually receive God's righteousness through what Jesus did on our behalf. It's just mind blowing to me that, that we are how we are and who we are, but we can also have God's righteousness through Christ, through the Holy Spirit who lives in us now. What do you think about that? I mean that's a humbling Yeah, he's our sobering advocate. Yeah, he is our advocate. Yeah. Because I fail every day, right. constantly. And every time I turn around, I'm like, I messed up again. You know, <laughs> sometimes it's big, sometimes it's little. You know, last week I did so much church, mm-hmm. and after you miss so much, and 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 99 percent of it was necessary. Right. But after a while, it begins to you know your faith that you can do it. Right. This morning, I got up at the right time, <laughs> and then I I was just uh, like, I can't do this. I reset the alarm for 45 minutes, like my six cats were going to allow me to <laughs> And then the alarm went off again. And then I'm thinking, I really don't feel like that. Right. And then God put in my heart and in my mind something I told Pastor Cheryl last Sunday when I went forward. I need to be there. Absolutely. And all of a sudden, it was as though, you know, the <laughs> whole room was, I need. Gives you a new motivation to get up and get going. Man, I pushed cats off. I picked <laughs> that thing back and I said, get me ready. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and then and then I thought, oh, I can't possibly make it on time. And then the other thought came, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> what you are experiencing, is, and we'll get to this in chapter 2, uh, but what this relates to is Romans chapter 2, verse 15. It says that the law of God is written in our hearts. That, you know, the, the, the Ten Commandments, the 613 laws, it's all in us by our very nature of how God created us. It says that the law is written in our hearts, our conscience also bearing witness. You know, we had the little Jiminy Cricket, the conscience will be your guide. Well, God placed that conscience there to point us to the law that is written on our hearts automatically and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. You know, we battle because we got this conscience. We got this law of God in our heart and we're like, I need to go. But we begin to excuse ourselves from it but then we're convicted of again accusing ourselves of it and this is back and forth battle constantly what Paul talks about in chapter 7 about the battle he went through but chapter 2 verse 15 it's a real good one to hit even for atheists and unbelievers like well you know that murder is wrong rape is wrong stealing is wrong lying is wrong how do you know that that's wrong even though you don't believe in God it's because God's law is written on the heart of every man Saved and unsaved alike. God's put that conscience in us. Every civilization that I'm aware of says it's wrong to murder somebody. Where did that come from if they're not a godly nation? Still came from God. Because it's inherently within us as human beings. Totally separates us from the animal kingdom. Which debunks evolution right off the top of the gate. Because animals just kill each other because that's what animals do. They don't have a conscience. But humans have a conscience placed there by God, and that conscience points us to the law of God, which is written on our hearts by our very nature of how God created us. And that's how we know what right and wrong is. Even if you don't believe in God, you still have that because God still placed it even within the unbeliever. 
And that's eventually, I think, what he uses to draw us to him. Because we know, you know, I, I do these things that aren't right. I, don't, I wonder how I can get myself right again. Of course, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto so me. So that's a complete contradiction to the total depravity argument. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have that within us just by nature. And he, he talks about it a lot in chapter 1, and I think he writes that in chapter 2 to support what he's about to say. Because he's talked here about the gospel, about what it is, you know, how to get to it through belief, and that what we receive when we receive salvation, we receive the righteousness of God, and that we are to live by faith. And then he goes on, it kind of takes a major shift here for the rest of chapter 1, the entirety of chapter 2, and part of, most of chapter 3, if not the whole part of chapter 3, of the wrath of God. If this is what you got without God, here's the gospel. Here's how to receive it. You should live by faith in it. And if you don't, here's what this is going to look like for you. Hence, people like this. They've just gone in all kinds of ways of themselves. And this is exactly who and what he's talking about here uh, for the rest of chapter 1. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. It's interesting. He says that this is revealed from heaven. You know, I'm a very huge advocate that you got to preach the gospel to people. That you must hear. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I'm not, I, I try not to be on such a level that I feel like God needs me or even us to reach somebody with the gospel. We should be used by God, yes. But this says it's revealed from heaven. Again, through the conscience, through nature itself, which he goes on to talk about, that God will reveal this to us. Even people who weren't raised in church, even people who haven't heard the gospel, they inherently know there's something bigger out there. There's, there's. You don't, I'm sorry. Well, how did those people not have? Well, we're going to read about that. They probably do have a conscience. They just it. They just exactly. We're, we're, we're actually going to read that exact answer here in a minute. <laughs> so this is revealed from heaven. To, un, to all ungod or against it says all ungodliness and unrighteousness who hold the truth in unrighteousness which is interesting that there is a truth in unrighteousness what do you think that truth in unrighteousness is it's an interesting phrase that he uses there uh, and this may not make any sense but I think it's, it's just what Paul said here the truth in unrighteousness is what happens mm -hmm. to you inside, in your heart, in your mind, when you reject God. Exactly. I believe that you're right exactly nail on the head on that one. It is what, and that's what he's basically setting up, is this is what's going to happen to you if you reject the truth of righteousness. Is the truth of unrighteousness is you're going to be turned over to yourself and you're going to be so far away from God that it's going to be... You can't come to God. It could come to that point. I, I, was to, I mean, I think everybody always has an open invitation, but we become so filled and full of ourselves that we just get in our own way. Does God ever give up on us? There's a point. Well, we'll again, we'll read about it here in okay. a minute. We'll <laughs> you know, um, back in Genesis... Nine, I think it is. It says, My spirit will not always strive with man. I mean, that goes all the way back to the flood, pre flood, and through the flood. Um, I don't think that that means he cuts us off, but I think there comes a point where he may just kind of say, Well, I gave you your chance. If you want to come to me, come to me, but I'm not going to keep. He gives us one chance. Do what? I don't think he gives us one chance. Right. We're true. Yeah. It's over. He gives us 
over and over. Absolutely. I think there just comes a point. I don't know. What do y'all think about that? I've always been taught or understood that, you know, you can deny the, that tug so many times. That right. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah. It's not. It's, but I don't know if that's due to complacency or if that's that, that he's not offering you anymore. I, I don't know that. Right. Because then I go to Revelation 3. 20 where he says behold I stand at the door and knock mm -hmm. if any man opens the door I think he's always kind of there knocking and nudging right. but I think we become so hard hearted and so full and of our own sins that we've to. blocked it out and you see people on deathbed that has fought it their whole life right. and all of a sudden ooh, it got real serious it, it real got quick real serious real quick yeah. well when you when you know you're about to cross over right. somewhere, <laughs> or lower, yeah. uh, you, you can to get serious. Absolutely. So he goes on to say, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it to them. So he's saying, uh, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, ungodliness, and even who hold the truth of unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. That word manifest means to be made clear. Again, through our conscience, which he talks about in chapter 2. For God has shown it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. It's amazing to me that people will look at nature and say that all just happened. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's it take and, and some people have said it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. I mean, to believe that all this precise, fine-tuned order came from nothing, that nothing was the driving force that created all of it, and built within it is intelligence and all these crazy sorts of things. I just, I can't even get in that kind of mindset. Right. Do y'all know of Mark Lowry? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. yeah. He's also a comedian. Yeah. And he has this video that, that I keep playing periodically and just for this one part of it. Uh, it's called The Home Depot. And there's this one part. He had a went bought his first house. He invited people over, and one of his friends brought uh, a lady with one of his. The couple brought right. a friend of that was, and and then she says he they, she got to talking politics, <laughs> and he said, "I'm a Christian, so I vote." the way I feel that God wants me to vote. And she right. says, well, I don't believe in God. And then he goes on to this long thing. He says, I don't have enough faith to believe in the Big Bang. Right. I don't have enough faith to believe that there's no God. And his watch, of course he made comedy with part, right. very part of it, but the message yeah. was going right there. He said, I take my watch, and I love my watch, and I can take it and put a hammer and, and just bang it up and shake it in a bag for five million years. <laughs> what is the chance that after five million years I'm going to open this bag and there's going to be a working watch? Functioning anywhere? watch again, yeah. He said, I don't even have enough faith to believe that. <laughs> so I, I have to have faith in God. Because I can't believe that. The, well, that it just makes more sense to believe that God did it. It does. That a designer and a creator and an organizer behind it set it all up. Right. Uh, and, and I've yet to have an atheist, an evolutionist, or anyone explain to me where the stuff came from that exploded. Exactly. <laughs> what ignited. Who created that? Yeah, who created that? What ignited the explosion? And how did no, it all come down in perfect, in perfect place order. and perfect order? And you know, and, and even within, you know, it says that the invisible things that um, 
Invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead or his authority, so that these people are without excuse. You know, I, I've thought and pondered about evolution. I'm like, you know, it's been more than once in my life that I have found the need for an extra pair of arms. And I know I'm not the only person who's ever thought that. Why haven't humans evolved an extra pair of arms? Because the whole point of evolution is you're adapting to your needs in your environment. I could use an extra pair of arms, and maybe an extra pair of legs, or maybe an extra brain, you know. But no one has ever developed that. How, and, and I always go to how in the world can a, a, a surgical book be written if we weren't all designed exactly the same way? And since we are, that debunks evolution because evolution says things just develop on their own and adapt to their own environment. That means that we should have all kinds of different types of humans that's by a, this point. That's a very good, yes. good argument. Yeah. And that's very just good. not what we see in nature. Um, but God is, is saying here that I've done all these things so that people are without excuse. People really don't have an excuse. But here's what happened. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. And you hear that all the time. Oh, I believe in a higher power, maybe. There's something bigger out there that started it all. The but they never say who it is. They will not give God the credit or the glory. It says that they know there's a God, but they glorify him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. That's where evolution comes from. That's where select what they call natural selection comes from. And all these crazy ideas that, that Darwin was pushing back in the 1800s. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's what's happened. And we're, we're getting a little short on time, so I'm going to jump around a little bit here in a second. But um, it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Most atheists consider themselves to be extremely intelligent. They all look to Charles Darwin as the guy. They came up with all this stuff. And I've read some books recently just to kind of explore where their mind is. And uh, one of the recent ones I wrote, read is by his guy's last name is Coyne. Um, it's called Why Evolution is True. And I went through the whole book, and every time they get to a point, and he quotes Charles Darwin constantly, but every time they get to a point where it's something they can't explain, they just say, we, we haven't figured this out yet. Or it's such a mystery that it baffles the whole atheistic community and blah, blah, blah. But they we either have go that, the answer to but this. But we have mystery. the answers to it. Exactly. I have a simple answer to what they can't figure out. But then they also add in there, well, since we know that blah, 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 since we know that mil over millions of years, yada, 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 so they make all these assumptions based on what some other smart guy came up with 150 years ago, a.k.a. Charles Darwin, since, you know, we know this and since we understand this, but they don't know it. And they don't understand it. They don't even know where it all came from to begin with. They can't explain that, but they create all of these mindsets and ideologies, and that's where it says that they became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I always go back to Psalm 14, 1 and Psalm 53, 1 that says, the fool has said there is no God. I mean, it all ties back. That's Old Testament stuff. And here, they're saying the same thing. They've just simply known God but glorified Him not as God. And they've come up with all these crazy ridiculous things that they're calling a truth, which is a non-truth. And this is exactly what they've done. Verse 23 says, And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. That they've made an image. They've violated commandment one and two. They've made themselves their own God. They've created an image of God. Even a mental image of God. Wherefore, and here's the answer to those questions you guys are asking. It says, Wherefore, God also gave them up 
to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. We'll get into that maybe next week. But the, the point is, it says God gave them up. Later on down through here, in verse 28, it says God gave them over to a reprobate mind. So that's what's happened to these people. God has just turned them over to their own devices, turned them over to their own foolishness and said, here's the answer. You can have God's righteousness through faith in Christ, but if you want to turn all of that into something else, verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, that's exactly what this transgender movement is about. We're worshiping people's ideologies, even of their own body, of what God has created, and they're turning it into something that God didn't intend it to be. Who created them? Right, who created them? Which just got under my skin for weeks when they had this, it was hilarious, back in April 1st was this day of transgender, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, what an appropriate day to <laughs> have that as a national day of reckoning. April Fool's Day, and, I think it's appropriate. and Biden got up there and he said that we ought to honor these people because they're created in the image of God. He keeps using that. He uses the Bible to tell us this is why you should love these people. But these people have been given over to their own mind and to their, it says a reprobate mind, and to their own devices, and they've just gone in the way of themselves. And that's what's happened to people like this guy in the picture. Because God's just turned them over and said, "Okay, you made you know we have that phrase. You've made your bed, now lie in it. You know, go for it. See how that works out for you." I think made, do what? Weren't they made in the uh, the sinful image of Adam? That's the thing. When you really get down to actual biblical theology, Adam was made in the image of God, and Eve. Chapter five of Genesis it says about Seth that. Adam had a son in his own image because Adam and Eve had fallen into sin, had corrupted the image that God had made them in to begin with, and they had become sinful, and all the children from them moving forward was created in the image of Adam, which was a corrupt meaning, image. Meaning they were eternal to begin with. And now they were eternal to begin with, sin-free, but now they're sinful and temporary because they have to die because of sin. So all of us are really not technically made in the image of God. We're made in the image of Adam. Yeah. Who was made in the image of God? But we're a corrupt version of that. And that's why we're not eternal. I must have read Genesis a hundred times in my life and I've never... Yeah, Genesis 5, if you go back and read it, it says that, that he, a lot of sense, so. yeah, and we're created in a corrupt word. version. Yeah. And then, which I love, Colossians, we'll get into it later, I'm sure down the road, it says that Jesus is the expressed image of God. So the true person... Which is why he's perfect and we're not. Which is why he's perfect and so we're we, not. But we can be made in the image of God through Christ. That's the whole point of this. Yeah is to draw us and point us to Jesus because He's the true image of God. It says that He is the image of the invisible God is what Colossians says. So if we want to be back into the image of God from God's perspective, we receive Christ into our life, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we have an eternal existence at that point moving forward. And when God sees us, He sees Jesus. And that's how we can be made back into the image of God through Christ. It's kind of like this weird, interesting circle. But you're right. We are made in a corrupt version of the original image in a human perspective of what God created. So that flies all over me when I especially hear a president stand up there and misuse the Bible that way to defend people like this and say, well, they're made in the image of God. Well, we're all a corrupt version of that because we're all sinful. And that's what people need to understand is we need to be restored to God through Jesus so that we can actually become the true image of God that He intended for us to begin with. We need uh, Billy Graham to be able to counsel all these presidents. So yes. <laughs> we're, we have lost a that. lot of our... What do I, and we don't have very many Billy Grahams anymore. Well, it's, but they're... they're Titans of 
debate. And right. They're more and loose nobody taking their place. Yeah, Charles Stanley passed away, and a lot of it just they're not. There's nobody there to go talk to them. And, and, and Billy Graham was great at that. Yes, yes, he was yes, awesome. Was. And, and they didn't corrupt him. Exactly right. Yeah, he, he made a good influence on them. He was too sweet. Yeah, he <laughs> that's right. He, he All right. Well, happy Mother's Day to those online. We'll end there and pick up there next week. So we'll see you guys then. Hope you have a great week.